on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. How we do that, how we engage audiences, what kinds of experiences we create. Museums, like every other industry in the world, are being disrupted by technology and demographic changes and income distribution shifts and artificial intelligence and everything else. So this is a moment when every smart cultural organization is really looking at how do we do what we do and why do we do what we do and for whom and then changing the ways that we think about engaging audiences. So Levine Museum in keeping with its heritage and its identity is doing exactly that right now. Catherine Hill is president and CEO of the Levine Museum of the New South, whose exhibits and programming focus on life in the North Carolina Piedmont after the Civil War. Previously, Catherine served as chief operating officer of the History Colorado Center and as a management consultant to more than two dozen other museums and cultural organizations around the country. Her work has included opening Imagine It, the Children's Museum of Atlanta, serving on the charter management team of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and creating visitor services programs at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, and Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. In this episode, we explore what is different about the Levine Museum, whether it has a social agenda, whether it should change its name, and what the museum is unabashedly about. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Catherine, welcome. Thank you for having me. How do you describe the Levine Museum of the New South? Levine Museum of the New South is really a trailblazer museum. It was interesting. I had heard about it. It's 26 years old. I've been in the museum field for 33 years. I'd heard about Levine Museum practically since the moment it started, but I'd never been here. And when I came to interview, I was surprised at how small it is because its national footprint is much, much bigger. Levine Museum of the New South really re redefined for the field what a history museum could be because really from the beginning has been so actively engaged in the community. It never set itself up as sort of an authority on the history of the New South from afar. It always located itself right in the heart of Charlotte, committed from the very beginning to telling everyone's story, not the stories that scholars think are most important, not the leadership stories necessarily, but everybody's story. Is the Levine Museum of the New South about the South, or is it about Charlotte? Yeah, that's a good question. Nuevolution, which was an exhibit about the burgeoning popu Latino population in the South, that exhibit, I think, had a broader scope. Without Sanctuary, which was an exhibit that we hosted, it wasn't an exhibit we did or produced. 
that had a broader scope too, that looked at lynching in the South. But the mission statement actually talks about this place examining the history of Charlotte and the Piedmont region. So is it New South? That's a good question. I think the way that the founders defined New South was that it was a place, and that's the South, that it was a time post-Civil War, and that it was an idea, which is about a place sort of in a state of constant reinvention. But the, the scope of the content, the focus of the dialogue has really been regional as in Charlotte and the Piedmont region, and really not so much further afield. When one thinks of a museum, Mm -hmm. many images come to mind. Mm -hmm. What would one see when they walk through the doors? Not something that looks like a traditional museum. And, uh, you know, that whole idea, and in the field we've debated, what is a museum? I mean, how do you define that? Because the historic home that is staffed by 0.5 FTE, and that's a person who's the director and also the chief housekeeper, that's a museum. And then the Met is a museum and everything in between. And I, for a long time, we really thought museums were collections-based. If you had collections, that's what defined a museum. And then children's museums came along and science centers came along and they weren't necessarily collections based. So then we had to kind of reframe that definition. I think museums are really places, traditionally in a way, that have gathered people in a space and offered uh, visitors opportunities for informal free choice learning. And, and that's what's defined a museum as opposed to a YMCA or a classroom. So when one walks in the door, one sees an opportunity to gather. There's a gift shop. There's a generous lobby. Beyond the lobby is a great big atrium. And there's a sort of flat floor theater space. What are tucked away are some of the exhibit experiences, and that's kind of an interesting thing and unique to Levine and sort of in keeping with the way that we've thought about programming because exhibits here have always been launching pads to dialogue, to conversation, to program, as opposed to show pieces of collections objects. That's never what we've been about. Let's pick up on that because... Mm-hmm. The Levine often describes itself as a place where it showcases history to build community. Mm -hmm. How does history build community? It's a really good question. When I started here, I thought history is so helpful in building community because history grounds us in a series of facts and then helps us understand the varying perspectives of the people who lived that history, who continue to be influenced by that history. And it is around that that we can come together to understand each other. So as I thought more about it, I thought, oh, no, no, history is not useful in building community. History is essential in building community. We can't understand who we are, how we got to this place, why you and I look at the same set of circumstances and see them so completely differently unless I understand your story and you understand mine. And history is just the collection of our understanding, our stories of how we got to this place. And we certainly can't come together to think about what we share in common, what our values are, and how we want to create a different kind of community unless we understand that history and unless we understand those varying perspectives. How should history be told? Inclusively. And I think that if history is deemed the purview of the academics and the scholars, then you get sort of one way of telling history. If you think about history as something that belongs to all of us, as history is everything that happened before this very moment, then 
you have to think more broadly about history's story. History's our story. And the way it should be told is by all of us. And I think that technology helps us do that in ways that we've never been able to do before, which in some ways makes it much, much, much more daunting to think about how you tell history. And on the other hand, it makes it much more exciting. This isn't just about reading the books or the papers from the important white men who told the story. This is about websites and digital content and protest signs and newspapers. And this is history told by everybody. Charlotte is described as a New South city. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the history of a city who finds its identity looking into the future? Mm -hmm. I've lived in a lot of different cities. I think the challenges are the same in all of them. And cities all over the United States approach them differently. This idea that a new South City erases its history, takes down its old buildings, doesn't celebrate them and say the way that Charleston does. We all polish our history, right? We want to polish our history. It's in our best interest. We need to kind of move forward. But it's there. The history is there. So... When I arrived in Charlotte, and it will be two years at the end of this month, it was the loveliest welcoming. I met so many people in my first two and a half weeks here, and everyone was so friendly. And they all said, if there's anything I can do for you. And then they'd give me their number, so I knew that they meant it. And then two and a half weeks after I got here, Keith Lamont Scott was shot, and the city erupted. And... All of a sudden, we were all confronted with a Charlotte that many, many people hadn't seen and didn't want to see. And I kept hearing people would come to me and they'd apologize and they'd say, this isn't, this isn't my Charlotte. Well, in fact, it is our Charlotte. It is our Charlotte. And we can have beautiful new buildings and we can erase the, the sort of remnants of the old South but it's right here and it's in the ground. And what I think is impressive about Charlotte, I, when I got here, of course, the city was still reeling from the discovery that out of 50 major U.S. cities, Charlotte ranked 50th in terms of economic mobility. And Charlotte had not let that go. And then the Charlotte uprising happened. And Charlotte still hasn't let that go. And struggling to reconcile the prosperity and success of so much of the city and the lifelong poverty that too many people are consigned to. But there are many, many people in Charlotte in leadership positions who are not okay with that. That's a testament to Charlotte's real, I think, commitment to a value system that we don't necessarily live yet, but to which we aspire. Given that context, is the museum setting out to tell a particular history? We don't set out to tell a particular history, but we do set out with a particular value system. And the values that the founders articulated back in 1991 talked about scholarship and inclusivity and collaboration. Those were not values that necessarily governed history museums, which were about scholarships, certainly, but excellence. And when we talk about using history to build community, we are talking about building a more equitable Charlotte. So is there an agenda? Yes. Does that mean that we're prescribing a path forward? No. Does it mean that we only tell stories of social justice warriors? No. We're going to tell everybody's story. We're going to look at all of it. But we are aspiring to build a stronger, more equitable Charlotte. Catherine, let's talk about that. Because as I think about the Levine, it strikes me that a better name for it might be the Charlotte Center for community engagement and social justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair reading? Yeah, I think so. 
and we're thinking a lot about just how porous our walls should be. First of all, museums across the field and across genres are struggling because people don't need museums in the way they used to. And everybody is looking at changing demographics and what that's doing to visitation. But even beyond that, for Levine Museum, we've always invited the community in to help us create exhibits. I think we're now really kind of out of the exhibit business and into the experience business and that the ways that we're going to collect those stories, the ways we're going to tell them, the ways we're going to create these experiences are really much more intricately involved with the ways that we invite community in. So I think this will be a place of culture making, not just culture telling. So should we be called a museum? I I think that's a good question. And this idea about the New South, which I think the founders and staff and board all have found such an aspirational, inspirational term. We did a public image survey a year ago, and we asked museum goers all over the city, what do you think of the term New South? And 23% responded positively and 23% responded negatively, and 54% said, huh? Didn't resonate with them at all. So this is a moment when all of those paradigms are on the table and we're thinking about them. I do want to underline this part of our discussion in this suggestion that the true identity of this place is a center for community engagement and social justice and calling this institution what it is as it seeks to fulfill that mission. The Levine says that it emphasizes issues of culture, class, and race, and it explains and interprets events using the language of disparities, social justice, and civil rights. Is it fair to say that the Levine has an ideologically liberal point of view in its exhibits and programming? Well, I don't, I, I don't, I, liberal as opposed to conservative meaning anti-civil rights. I mean, I, I, I think it's an American point of view. At least the values we've come to accept, I think, as Americans. Well, let me defend my point. Yeah. Uh, in the write-up for the No Justice, No Peace exhibit, mm-hmm. The Levine says it wants to tell stories, quote, to create a Charlotte that guarantees equity and offers opportunity to all, Mm -hmm. which is an agenda. Mm -hmm. That is also an assertion of values. Mm -hmm. The values could be different. The values Mm -hmm. could be to create a Charlotte that guarantees uh, liberty or personal agency, different outcomes based on enterprise. Right. Those are terms often used by conservative thinkers. Right. So the language that is predominant in how Levine describes itself is language of progressive thinking. I don't think that equity and social justice is necessarily the purview only of liberals. And what I don't think we do here is suggest that there's only one way forward, because I think that we can have conversations about personal agency, about liberty, about equity in a much more holistic way. And I think that's one of the things that history might help us get our arms around, that we've been pursuing this idea of uh, freedom and justice for all. But how do we get there? What's the best way to get there? Where did we come close and where did we miss the mark and why? And what went wrong? And at the end of the day, especially in the South, where we went wrong was with slavery and racism. And that's a a legacy that we carry with us still. And that's the central tension point. Now, what we do about that, I don't think any political party has uh, has the solution, or they certainly haven't stepped up with that. 
Now, I understand exactly what you're saying, and we have struggled with this. So when we were putting together No Justice, No Peace, which was a very challenging project for us because we decided in the wake of the Charlotte uprising that we had to respond quickly. This was a community in crisis. If we were going to use history to help ground all of the conversations that were happening all over the city, then Levine Museum had to step up in some significant way. And so we did this rapid response exhibit. Now, museums don't do rapid response exhibits. That's just not our stock and trade. So we didn't have any real great paradigms around it. And we prototyped it first, printed stuff on big pieces of paper and hung them on the wall with tape and gave members and all kinds of people post-it notes and asked them to give us feedback on it, which was a really smart thing to do because we'd gotten it really wrong. And primary way that we had gotten it wrong was that we were editorializing like crazy. And people pointed that out to us. And we had one board member's husband who said, you lost me at the introductory panel. And I went back and looked at that panel. I thought, he is exactly right. He's exactly right. And he comes from a much more conservative bent. And I read it through his lens. I thought, yeah, no, we can't. We don't tee it up like this. And so we really rewrote the exhibit entirely. And we invited everybody in the community to contribute. People who, activists who are on the front line, but also police officers, civic leaders, uptown residents who said, okay, wait a minute, a black officer shoots a black man and this and what? I don't get it. Everybody's voice, everybody's perspective is in that exhibit, in their words, not in our words. We didn't edit it. We asked for statements and they are all there verbatim. They're excerpted too, so you don't have to sit there and read the whole thing. But without editorializing, that becomes a much more powerful examination of this event in Charlotte, what the historical context was around it, how people reacted to it. And that helps frame the conversation that we really have to have going forward. Catherine, if the Levine is truly going to be inclusive, then it should be particularly mindful of not editorializing. Right. But at the same time, you're saying the Levine is being more clear that it does have an ideological agenda. But isn't equity a universal value? Isn't that a founding value? I don't think that's conservative versus liberal or Republican versus Democratic. And I think that we stand so much a better chance of getting there if we're bringing people with disparate perspectives together in real genuine conversation about how we get there. Now, that's a challenge, and you are not the only one to read that language and think, oh, yeah, another bleeding heart liberal, like, you know, nothing here for me. And we have done enough evaluation of dialogues over the past 10 years to know that we are not bringing together a broad spectrum of ideological perspectives. The Levine is launching a new series called Hashtag Shaping Charlotte. Mm -hmm. It seeks to prompt conversation that leads to action. Mm -hmm. The first topic is called Unpacking Privilege. Mm -hmm. What is the action that the Levine wants to see happen? Well, again, we're not prescribing the action. The Shaping Charlotte came about, okay, let me back up. The museum, as I, as I said, the museum has used exhibits to prompt dialogue. And Levine was really maybe the first, but certainly a very early convener of what we call dialogue across difference, bringing together intact groups, but also groups of people who never knew each other before to have an exhibit experience and then to come together in a structured dialogue where different perspectives were shared, where maybe minds were opened. And that 
idea of dialogue really took root here. And after the Charlotte Uprising, you started to see dialogues everywhere, churches, civic organizations, everybody was having dialogues. And, and I think that that's great. But we also started to hear, yeah, okay, good, enough with the talking, like what are we going to do? So that's when we started thinking about Shaping Charlotte, which we hope brings people together in dialogue, that we use a common experience to frame questions, but also gives people ideas about what they might do about them. So if it's about unpacking privilege, or it's about Me Too, or it's about environment and sustainability here, that there are avenues we've introduced participants to organizations, to like-minded people, to things you can do in everyday life that makes a difference. Will participants be directed towards certain organizations? Um, they'll be introduced to certain organizations, right? Yes, but directed? No, not necessarily. But I, you know, you, you, you bring up a really important tension for us, which is how do we really get broad participation across the ideological spectrum here without inviting the avowed bigots? Because that's not that's not conversation we're going to entertain here. But people who are genuinely committed to a stronger, more equitable Charlotte, but don't necessarily think that we found the right way to do that. And that, that those values around individual responsibility and smaller government and all of that kind of stuff, that that's what gets us there. That's a conversation we ought to have in this community somewhere it should be safe to have that. Now, I don't know that that's happening much of anywhere in this country right now, which is, I think, a shame as we become increasingly polarized, but it's something we're really thinking hard about here. You do have a point of view. Yeah. It's part of your core values. Mm -hmm. It's your identity. It's your leadership. It's the staff that you hire. My guess is on an ideological spectrum, they lean left. And that's fine, it proudly so. So I'm just wondering, why don't you just plant a flag around that? And <laughs> you are either the Center for Community Engagement and Social Justice with an emphasis on equity, or you're not. Well, we are. We are, and we're unabashedly about social justice and equity. But we're not prescriptive about the path. So I, you know, I, I grew up in a family of sort of mixed perspectives, but I've been left leaning my whole life. And I remember reading this New Yorker article, and this was, I don't know, a couple decades ago about automobile safety and about Ralph Nader's campaign against the car makers and all of that kind of stuff. But what the writer was saying was, you know what the real, real key to better car safety was seatbelts. And that was an individual responsibility. And if we had poured more money into educating people about the importance of seatbelts, as opposed to going after the automobile industry, we might actually have saved more lives. Now, that's an interesting debate to me. And you raised that story to make what point? We are about social equity but we are not prescriptive about the path. This is really dense, complicated stuff. This is, it's rooted deep, deep, deep in our history. And it is not the Levine Museum's job to advocate for policy, but it is our job to bring people together around a deep dive into why we are where we are and what we might learn from the things we've tried in the past. Would the Levine consider a name change? I think this is a moment where everything is on the table, frankly. Now, Levine, 
we owe so much of what this museum is and that it is to the Levine family. This is the Levine Museum, but museum, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a question. We, we've had the same mission statement, I think, since 2001 or something like that. It talks about collecting, preserving, and interpreting very traditional museum activities when, in fact, we've never been an active collecting museum. And preserving is not what we do specifically, especially when it comes to objects. So... I think we are looking at that mission statement that will be work of the board this year. And does that result in a name change? Maybe. And knowing that the term New South doesn't resonate the way we thought it would or did, I, that gives us a lot of stuff we kind of have to work through that's at the very core of this museum. I do think... This museum has a legacy of innovation. It wasn't founded to be a traditional history museum, has never functioned as a traditional history museum. So why we do what we do and that spirit of innovation and community engagement and responsiveness, all of that stays. That's, that's at the very core of who we are. How we do that, how we engage audiences, what kinds of experiences we create. Museums, like every other industry in the world, are being disrupted by technology and demographic changes and income distribution shifts and artificial intelligence and everything else. So this is a moment when every smart cultural organization is really looking at how do we do what we do and why do we do what we do and for whom and then changing the ways that we think about engaging audiences. So Levine Museum, in keeping with its heritage and its identity, is it doing exactly that right now. In the technological landscape that we mm -hmm. are in, what is the compelling case for bringing people into a building? Ah, I think that's a great question. And that's one we're thinking about, too. Because there is nothing that substitutes for face-to-face -face conversation and interaction. And there's still a need for that, and there's still a place for that. And technology gives us a chance to engage audiences beyond our walls in ways that we've never had before. And it is really important that we look at all of those opportunities. I mean, y you can experience history in the places where the, it happened through augmented reality that you're able to access right on your device and in front of you see what it used to look like versus what it looked like today. You can hear voices and it's sort of the 21st century version of the historic walking tour, and that's pretty cool. So the way we're thinking about it now is that we can use experiences here as a launching pad that sends people out in the community, but we can also create experiences out in the community that bring people back because they want to dig deeper and they want to do it in conversation with others. If resources were not an issue, <laughs> what would you like to see? the Levine Museum be? I think Levine Museum should sit right in the center of every substantive conversation about issues in Charlotte. We should be the go-to place for the media as they try and pull apart school assignment. We should be the place that policymakers come to debate, discuss, and and look at the issues they're dealing with right now in the context of history. We should be a place where families come and tell stories and engage in intergenerational celebration. We should be the place that celebrates Charlotte's many diverse cultures that increasingly enrich this city. I think we should be a center of dialogue and understanding, and we should be a place of 
celebration and culture making. Is that place in the building we are in now? That's that's another kind of central point of conversation that we're having right now. We love this location and this building has served us well. And right now it's small in the places where we need it to be bigger and big in the places where we need it to be smaller. And if we are thinking increasingly about technology and technology-based experiences, I don't think that we need to be bigger. Museums thought, you know, we, in, especially back in the 90s when everybody was building new museums, the idea was it needed to be bigger. I don't think we need to be bigger. I think we need to be smaller, but I think we need to be more flexible. And this building does inhibit that. And there's so much going on in Uptown Charlotte. Are there opportunities for us to relocate? Yeah, maybe. And we're certainly exploring those. It's really important that we are clear about kind of the space we need. And as we think about the museum of the next decade and beyond, it's going to look very different. So that's the work we're doing right now as we're keeping our ears open. We Unlike most museums in Charlotte, we own this land. We own the dirt and we own the air. And so that gives us a, a real asset to bring to the table. Catherine, you were born in Montana. I was. And grew up in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your childhood. I was born in Montana. I lived there nine months, so it wasn't you know, the most memorable part of my life. But my father was a native Montana, and my mother is from British Columbia. She was a coal miner's daughter. And she married my father on the condition that he would not go back to school and he would never move her to Washington, D.C. or Chicago. And so the f in the first year that they were married, he went back to school at the University of Minnesota and got his master's in um, hospital administration. And he was an ambitious man. He, we, he did his residency in Rhode Island, so we moved there from Minnesota. And then he was offered a job at, in the business school at the University of Michigan to develop the hospital administration program there, essentially. So I was five before. We, I had two birthdays in one house. But we settled in Ann Arbor then for the next 10 years and um, watch the football team improve. And it was amazing time to be in Ann Arbor. We just, being a part of a university community was amazing. And my father did a lot of work in South America. And so we, we there were just a lot of interesting people in our lives all the time, which was, which was great, a great school system. It was a wonderful place to grow up during a pretty turbulent time. And then when um, halfway through seventh grade, we moved to Rhode Island, and that's where I learned about neighborhood. So we had a great university community in Ann Arbor, but it was definitely a community of grown-ups. In Rhode Island, I had a community of kids, and that was wonderful. We lived there for four years, and then we moved to Chicago. It didn't quite work out the way my mother had imagined, but... You know, from growing up transient like that, it, it wasn't easy as a kid, and especially the high school move. That frankly sucked. But sure broadened my perspective on the world. So we moved before my junior year in high school, and in order to punish my parents, I applied to college to go early. And I also applied to be a foreign exchange student, which I had no intention of really being, but I thought, this would make them nervous. And then I got selected to go to Costa Rica. So I spent four months in Costa Rica, which was amazing. Went to college halfway through my senior year in high school. And the wonderful thing about having experienced so many different places is that I can connect with a lot of different people because chances are, wherever you're from, I've been there if I haven't lived there. And and that's kind of a wonderful thing. Catherine, you went to Mount Holyoke College mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Why a woman's college? You know, it, it, I'm going to make it sound much more intentional than it really was. 
I was in Chicago. I wanted to go back to the Northeast in, in the worst way. And I had a good friend who was going to Mount Holyoke, and that sounded interesting to me. I'm not sure that I was really intent on going to a women's college, but I do think that I knew I wanted to go to a small liberal arts college, and Mount Holyoke accepted me. And it was a great decision. It was a great decision in retrospect. It was a place that not only gave women permission to take themselves seriously, but required it. So the smartest mathematician and the editor of the newspaper and the president of the student government were women. And that's when I decided to take myself seriously as a student. Catherine, how did you find your way to museum work? Well, it makes me feel bad because there are so many young people who really want to do museum work. I, I was in Chicago. I needed a temporary job. And I got assigned to the Field Museum of Natural History on a two-week assignment in the Human Resources Department. And I left there seven years later. I just, I just fell in love with that place, with that culture, and with the idea that museums were places of storytelling and they were places that could change the world. You were on the team that helped open the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind when you think about that experience? It made my career. And had I known just what an impact that museum was going to have and how many people it was going to attract, I never would have had the courage to take the job. When I took the job, people at the museum were asking whether I thought anybody would come because, you know, so many things to do in Washington, and this is a hard visit. And I'd say, yeah, I think we could get a million people, and we did two and a half million in our first year. It was an amazing experience, an amazing experience. And what I learned there is that museums can tell a compelling story, can engage visitors emotionally without sacrificing scholarship. And that was one of the biggest contributions that that museum has made to the field. Catherine, in 2008, you moved to Denver Mm -hmm. and took on the task of transforming the Colorado Historical Society into something else. What was that something else and what happened? Yeah, it was a state history museum that nobody ever visited and essentially got evicted because the Justice Center was expanding. So when I came on, it was sort of no sight, no lines on a blueprint. Since the days of the Holocaust Museum, I'd been working on building new museums, but I'd never had a chance to build one from the ground up. So this was an an amazing experience. But what I thought it needed to be was a, a center for civic engagement that our mission needed to be to cultivate the most well-informed, engaged citizenry in the nation who understood the present in the context of the past and who worked together to build a stronger Colorado. And that's the, that was the mission, and those were the exhibits that we chose to do in the early days. Catherine, as you think about your career, mm-hmm. what is the core work that you are doing? I think the core work is about telling stories that engage people emotionally and intellectually, that bring them together in shared experiences, that broaden their perspectives and encourage them to get actively involved in making the world a better place. And why is that important to you? Because I guess I was born thinking that my mission in life was to help make the world a better place. I think that's what we all should be doing in whatever ways we've chosen to do them. For me, it's always been through story. Thank you for your time today, Catherine. Thank you so much, Mark. Catherine Hill is president and CEO of the Levine Museum of the New South. She earned a bachelor's degree in political science and government 
from Mount Holyoke College. And now, a personal word. The Levine Museum of the New South is at a turning point. Catherine Hill has inherited the Levine Museum at a time when cultural institutions are being disrupted nationally. The Levine Museum faces particular challenges in a rapidly changing competitive landscape in Charlotte. It will take extraordinary leadership for the Levine Museum to thrive in the years ahead. The mission of the Levine Museum of the New South is to tell the story of the American South after the Civil War, with a focus on Charlotte and the surrounding Carolina Piedmont. Over a remarkable period of innovation and productivity since its founding, the Levine Museum has done just that. The story goes that in the summer of 1990, an eighth grade teacher, Ann Batten, felt strongly that Charlotte could do with a new history museum. And so she called a former student of hers, Sally Robinson, a civic leader in Charlotte, and made her pitch. Sally later recalled, who could say no to their old eighth grade teacher? Over the next year, Sally organized a small committee of community leaders and historians that set plans in motion for a new history museum. The committee became a board of directors. The board raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and hired Robert Weiss, a young scholar, as its first executive director and charged him with establishing a museum with no walls. The museum created exhibits and kiosks that were placed around the city including ones about when Southern women went to college and the history of basketball in the Piedmont. In 1995, the board hired its second executive director, Emily Zimmern, and raised enough funds to purchase a vacant office building. The building was retrofitted, the entrance was moved, and the museum was renamed in honor of philanthropists Sandra and Leon Levine. The exhibits and programming of the Levine Museum have included cotton fields to skyscrapers, an interactive timeline of the development of Charlotte and the Piedmont, Courage, the Carolina story that changed America, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, Purses, Platforms and Power, a fun and enlightening retrospective of women trailblazers in the 1970s, Changing Places, addressing issues of growth and community in the early 21st century. Families of Abraham, a photographic narrative exploring Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith traditions in Charlotte. New Evolution, showcasing how Latinos are shaping the South. And No Justice, No Peace, a community-created exhibit about police shootings throughout the nation and in Charlotte. Other exhibits have explored stories of forgotten musicians, the gay rights movement in America, the war on poverty in the Appalachians, Southern food and clothing, Southern writers and artists, Southern stereotypes in cartoons, and the contributions of Jewish, Cambodian, and Lebanese Americans to Southern culture and Charlotte history. The Levine Museum has told these stories with great skill and compassion, winning national acclaim. Emily Zimmer whose ambition and spirit define the museum, and who served as executive director until 2015, said this about the enterprise. Quote, the Levine Museum has provided a space where everyone's history is told, where everyone has an opportunity to share their story. We hear from the famous and powerful, as well as those whose stories are little known or have never been told. History matters. History is important for individuals, communities, and nations. It shapes our sense of self and our relationship to one another. It locates us in time and place and helps to give meaning to our lives." End quote. The Levine Museum has given meaning to thousands of citizens whose stories have been told on its exhibit walls and shared in the countless dialogues about community issues that the museum has hosted. Today, the Levine Museum is at a turning point. It faces a set of challenges very different than a generation ago. What is the museum experience in the digital age? Why go into a building that does not have an archive or collection? 
why convene in a space when other spaces are more technologically advanced and suited for gatherings and conversation? How does the Levine Museum position itself against newer institutions and media platforms vying to convene discourse around the same community issues? Should it present Southern history as broadly and objectively as possible, or should it focus on issues of equity and social justice in Charlotte? Catherine Hill is faced with all these questions. The museum could close, redefine itself, and reopen in a new way. It could lease space in a different building. It could sell its land to a developer and retain space in a newly branded high-rise structure. It could once again become a museum with no walls. Whatever it chooses to do, there is a window to do it. What will remain true is that our stories give meaning to our lives. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.